Hi everyone, my name is Heather Pitts. In this Learning Lounge session, we will discuss emerging GI issues in the COVID-19 patient. COVID-19 is caused by the RNA virus severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus type 2 or SARS-CoV-2. COVID-19 presents differently in individuals with varying clinical symptoms. Cases can present as asymptomatic, mild to moderate upper respiratory tract infection, or severe symptoms, including dyspnea, hypoxia, and can lead to death caused by respiratory failure or multi-organ failure. COVID-19 enters the host through the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or ACE2 receptor. These ACE2 receptors are located in the lungs and the GI tract. ACE2 is highly expressed in alveolar cells in the lung and in the cells of the GI tract, including the small and large intestines. Enterocytes of the small bowel are the cells that contain the highest amount of ACE2 receptors in the human body. The most common symptoms of COVID-19 are fever, cough, and fatigue. GI symptoms were overlooked in the early stages of the emerging pandemic. However, GI symptoms are now considered a common manifestation. The most common GI symptoms reported are diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, and abdominal pain. Severe GI symptoms have been described as hemorrhage, perforation, and severe inflammation. In previous coronaviruses, such as the SARS-CoV-1 in 2003 and the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in 2012, patients with severe disease also presented with digestive symptoms. Although COVID-19 is more commonly associated with respiratory symptoms, four subgroups of COVID-19 patients have been described. Type 1 are patients who have GI symptoms such as diarrhea, anorexia, vomiting, nausea, and respiratory symptoms. Type 2 patients present with early GI symptoms followed by respiratory symptoms. And type 3 patients have respiratory symptoms only, whereas type 4 patients have GI symptoms only. Studies have suggested that 75% of COVID-19 patients experienced at least one GI symptom. It has been reported that in hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19 who are admitted to the ICU, almost half had GI symptoms on admission. It has also been demonstrated that half of COVID ICU hospitalized patients developed hypomotility-related complications that required gastric feedings to be held, and about half developed an ileus. COVID-19 can induce metabolic stress in the patient's GI tract, which causes mucosal damage, such as GI bleeding and erosive gastritis. GI symptoms may also be from treatment side effects. Medications used to treat COVID-19 such as antivirals and antibiotics can cause nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Patients with persistent diarrhea may require the, replace, the placement of a rectal tube. Constipation and ileus can also be an issue for critically ill COVID-19 patients, as they tend to be heavily sedated and may also require paralytics. It is important to monitor the abdominal exam and have patients on an adequate bowel regimen who demonstrate constipation issues. There are published case reports of GI perforation in patients of all ages with COVID-19. The prevalence of perforation induced by COVID-19 is currently unclear. Many causes have been proposed for the COVID-19 GI perforations, including high-dose steroids, tocilizumab, stress-induced mucosal damage, small vessel thrombosis, and non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia. Direct infection of endothelial cells by coronavirus 
through the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 has also been suspected, as well as the high concentrations of pro-inflammatory cytokines activated by COVID-19. Colonic perforation caused by interleukin-6 receptor antagonist therapy has been reported. Tocilizumab is a medication used to treat conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. The FDA issued an emergency use authorization or EUA for tocilizumab for the treatment of hospitalized adults and pediatric patients two years of age and older who are receiving systematic cytochrome steroids and require supplemental oxygen, non-invasive or invasive mechanical ventilation, or ECMO. This medication is known to cause lower intestinal perforation, although the mechanism is unknown. Prior diverticulitis is considered a risk factor for this. Some case reports have described microcirculatory thrombosis in the mesentery vessels as a cause for the perforation. In the literature, patients that have required surgery due to perforation have a very high risk of mortality. The crosswalk between the gut and the lung microbiome is referred to as the gut-lung axis. The gut-lung axis is a bidirectional connection linking the gut microbiota to the airway immune system through the circulatory and lymphatic systems. It has been observed that patients with influenza virus respiratory disease are often accompanied by gastroenteritis-like symptoms. Studies have also shown an increased prevalence of pulmonary disease in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. The GI tract is the largest immune organ in the body and plays a critical role in combating infections and pathogens. Since most of the immune cells are found in the intestine, the gut microbiome plays an important role in the immunity of the gut and in the immune response of other organs. The gut microbiome may influence the immune response of COVID-19. It is suspected that intestinal enterocytes may mediate the invasion of the virus and activation of gastrointestinal inflammation. Diet has a strong impact on the gut microbiota. A diet high in soluble fiber, such as whole grains, legumes, fruits and vegetables, have been shown to decrease inflammatory cytokines, such as C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, interleukin-18, and tumor necrosis factor. It is important to maintain gut integrity, and short-chain fatty acids are central to the maintenance of epithelial integrity of the GI tract. Short-chain fatty acids are derived from intestinal microbial fermentation of indigestible fibers. These metabolites produced by gut bacteria translocate across the intestinal barrier to reach systemic circulation and modulate the lung immune response. Short chain fatty acids can decrease inflammation and allergic responses. Probiotics may have a beneficial impact on COVID-19. The actions of probiotics are usually strain specific. Their beneficial effects can include enhancement of the intestinal epithelial barrier, competition with pathogens for nutrients and adhesion to the intestinal epithelium, production of antimicrobial substances, and modulation of the host immune system. The gut microbiome in COVID-19 patients has been shown to have a decreased diversity and increased opportunistic pathogens. Specific opportunistic bacteria were associated with a more severe COVID disease course. It has been suggested that prolonged dysbiosis persists in a significant proportion of COVID-19 patients, and that patients who have had COVID-19 have an altered gut microbiome even after their COVID symptoms have resolved. Dysbiosis likely sustains a low-grade inflammation over time. 
there has been concerns raised about a possible fecal oral route of transmission. Fecal samples from patients who have recovered from COVID-19 test positive for RNA up to 42 days after disease resolution. This viral RNA has also been found in the GI epithelium up to 90 days after recovery. At our facility, we have observed GI issues in our severely ill COVID-19 ICU patients. This includes constipation, diarrhea, vomiting, and ileus. Our adult tube feeding protocol is usually ordered at time of intubation for our COVID-19 patients. But if not, it is initiated within 24 hours of intubation and starts a high protein semi-elemental formula at 40 mLs per hour with two protein modulars. The feeding type and rate are then adjusted by the RDN based on the patient's individual needs. Enteral feedings are initiated via an orogastric tube, which is usually placed at time of intubation. This is typically removed and replaced with a small bore nasogastric tube and secured with a bridle by our RDN team, tube team. Feeding across, excuse me, feeding access remains gastric unless there is intolerance to gastric feedings. Gastric feedings are maintained at goal rate while patients are prone based on the most recent research. If vomiting does occur, patients are started on prokinetics and tube feeding is restarted. If vomiting persists, the patient may require advancement of their small bore feeding tube to a post pyloric position. This is done at bedside by our RDN tube team when the patient is turned supine. Despite these measures, in some patients who develop an ileus, they continue to have feeding intolerance and require parental nutrition support. In our experience, patients who develop feeding intolerance after feeding tolerance has already been established and is refractory to these treatment strategies have a very high mortality rate. Hospitalized COVID-19 patients in the ICU with GI symptoms may be at high risk for severe disease. These patients are at high risk for hypomotility issues and need to be monitored for symptoms such as abdominal pain and vomiting as bowel perforation has been reported in the literature. There may be value in promoting a high fiber diet that includes probiotics to reduce systemic inflammation for the general public prior to a COVID-19 diagnosis, but could also be used with asymptomatic patients or patients with mild symptoms. Research continues on the impact COVID-19 has on the gut, GI issues related to COVID-19 and its treatments, including the possible complication of bowel perforation. New research is looking at the gut-lung axis in COVID-19 and what impact COVID-19 has on the gut microbiome with studies looking at treatment strategies to modulate the gut microbiome supporting the use of probiotics and fiber. Thank you so much for joining me for this Learning Lounge session.